Good evening, everybody. This is Professor Hassey speaking live and in color from Claremont, California. Our last week of business. You three. So. You're right. Excuse me. I agree with you. Uh, so uh, our last week of Business Finance 330 for this fall one session, uh, we'll be reviewing our final examination, some of our work to do on that. Uh, most of you have posted assignment number four, the spreadsheet and mini paper, I guess you could say. I'll be reviewing those uh, works in the next day or so, and we'll be posting those grades and the solutions because uh, those uh, there are some questions on our final that are concerning with capital budget process. And I would think if you, uh, you would need that feedback for maybe some of those questions. Leading up to our final video posted uh, at the end of this week, it might be Thursday, it also might be Friday that I post that to review assignment number four and wrap up the course one more time. This video this evening is being simulcast. If any of you are familiar with uh, some of the sporting events, it's being simulcast on um, for two classes. Uh, the, the class that you are all in, uh, the remote uh, synchronous class, but I'm also recording this for our online asynchronous class, which is also in their final week of business finance. You both classes have basically the same material. It's just presented just a little bit differently but I thought for the sake of uh, being efficient this week, I would do a simulcast, my first ever simulcast. I feel like Vin Scully. Okay. <clears throat> so here's where we stand coming into this final week. Uh, we have uh, roughly uh, two more chapters to go, but I am gonna go over four chapters tonight. Chapters 16 about debt financing, chapter 17 about dividends, uh, we did go over that a little bit in a prior week and then talk about chapter 18, long-term planning and chapter 19, short-term planning to wrap up our finance course for this fall. The final examination has been out there for a week and has one more week to go. It is due this coming Sunday, October 15th. There can be no extensions. All work needs to be posted by Monday, by Sunday night at midnight. Course evaluation uh, also are due on the 18th. If you so desire to complete an evaluation, I'll be talking about that a little bit later. And all grades will be posted for this course. Your final grade will be posted by Friday, October 20th, as you conclude this uh, session of fall. I know some of you are taking courses in the next fall two session as well but your grades will be posted to the registrar and to you so they have that information so you can enroll or do whatever you need to do for the fall two session coming up. Here's our blackboard at the, this time. Remember, we have in uh, course uh, announcements, here are the links for your course evaluation. Yes, you guys are sick and tired of being always surveyed. I agree, I understand with that. Yes, it can be a pain. No, people do pay attention to these results that you put down. People like me, people like our Dean, people like our provost, the academic person of, in charge of the University of Laverne, the provost, his name is Roy Kwan, and even the president of the University of Laverne, especially when she does not like Rick Hassey, she's going to check up on him and make sure his students like him, or at least are getting a satisfactory, I'm just teasing, but even the president does review uh, many of the course evaluations from students. You know your CRN number for this course, find your CRN number and click on the evaluation. It takes you about two minutes to do and you give us some meaningful feedback about your program here at the University of Laverne. So please, as you complete your final examine, examination and you complete your coursework, please uh, 
finish or complete your course evaluation. It has nothing to do with your grade. It's anonymous. I don't see them until about three months down the road. So uh, it has nothing to do with how I assess your coursework, nothing at all. It's just an additional tool for us managing our programs that we're doing a sufficient job or an insufficient, insufficient job and what we can do better to help our students. So please take the, a couple minutes of your time in the next week and complete this. I would be very appreciative. Another thing to remember as we close out this course is I do not forget you as we close out this course. If I leave the Blackboard site open for over for two years until I know the last student in this course has graduated and moved on, I keep this site open in case you need, need this information for any future courses where you might be using some of this material. This Blackboard will be open for a minimum of two years after we complete this course so you can go back and use it as a networking source. Another thing to remember is our YouTube playlist is available to you for life. Uh, it's kind of scary, but it is available to you for life in case you want to refer to it for information and videos about finance. And then finally, as I said earlier, I do not forget you. I keep track of every student I've ever had. It's, in, it's over 3,000 at my last count. And if you down the road need a letter of recommendation, need a reference from one of your professors, need some information about courses, other programs, graduate school, even financial management information, personal financial management information. If any of you need some help, I am now part of your network. Take it or leave it. And you can call on me for anything that you need after this course is over. I do not forget my students. And so if you need a recommendation for a job at your company, or you're thinking about finding a new career, or you're thinking about going to, on to another school or graduate work, a tip from Professor Hassey in regards to graduate work, have somebody else pay for it. Don't you borrow any more money or any money at all for graduate study. Graduate study is very good. It's very rewarding and it can help your career, but it is friggin' expensive, more than undergraduate education. Do not go into any more debt if you don't have to. I highly recommend not to do that. Have an employer pay. Have the United States government pay. Have your rich relative pay, whatever. But don't get into any more financial burdens. If you can't afford it, don't do it. You believe a professor is telling you that? A professor in the MBA program? But it's the God honest truth. There is no value to you to assume $50,000 more debt to get a graduate degree. There is no value in your career whatsoever. Trust me on that one. Take that for what it's worth. But if you do need recommendations to get into graduate school, be more than happy to do that. But my first question of you will be, how are you paying for it? And you should say, Mr. Hassey, it's none of your business. Just give me the friggin' recommendation and we'll move on. Okay. So there's a couple of uh, information items for you going forward after this class is over. Again, our final examination is posted to Blackboard. You need to do to give me two files minimum for this final examination work. One file is the work on the final examination, answering the questions, doing the work. And the second is a spreadsheet file of your portfolio as of Friday, October 13th to complete out the course. One last look of who's the wolf of Wall Street in this class. And that's a, a significant portion of your final examination grade. I believe it's 25% to make sure you do that portfolio and the work required for it correctly. So please don't forget a spreadsheet, not a P PDF, not a Word document, not a JPG picture, 
a spreadsheet of your portfolio from the beginning of our course to October 13th. If anybody has any questions or concerns about that, you let me know. Also, assignment four is completed. I will be posting the solutions to the spreadsheet and to the paper uh, within the next couple of days so you can see your grade and see your cumulative average up to this point in class heading into your final grade this weekend. Remember, if you have any holes in your grades, you have a zero somewhere that I, you never completed the work. You have a zero somewhere that maybe should be a grade and I have missed your posting of your work. Make sure you double check your grade situation and understand it. And if you have questions, please contact me. I need you to do this by Sunday because Monday I begin the grade analysis, analysis for the registrar's office. And I need all the grades signed off by you, making sure you don't have any issues with them so I can post. It's a real hassle once the grade posting is finished to go back in and try to change a grade. It can be done, but it is a hassle. It's a hassle for you. It takes you more time to get that information back. And to be honest with you, it's a pain in the neck for me to go into the system and redo it. But make sure now's the time to review your grades. Make sure you understand where you stand in this class currently. And then after I post assignment number four. So there's where we stand coming into this fat last week. The information you need to uh, complete the course. <coughs> Excuse me. The final examination is posted. The portfolio, you know what needs to be done. So uh, um, let me just stop for a minute and ask our remote learners, naturally the online students that this is simulcast with, cannot ask this question of me. But uh, does anybody in our class here uh, to this evening have any questions about the, uh, the last week's work, things to do, any, anything that you need to know before we begin our final lecture? Anybody? Will you be sending like an announcement of who was the Wolf of Wall Street for I will. class? Okay. <laughs> I will, Monica. When I uh, post the final grades on Thursday or Friday of next week, I will send an email to you all letting you know that uh, the grades are posted. And also I will be sending in that email who had the best performing stock portfolio. And I'll be asking that person for their mailing address so I can send them the ne necessary prices right prizes for that contest winner. So yes, Monica, I will announce that when I announce that the grades and the class has been officially closed. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? I will be having office hours on Thursday evening this Thursday from six to eight o'clock in case any of you have any last minute questions. Remember the portfolio is of the close of business on Friday, not any sooner, not any sooner. It's the close of business on Friday, October 13th. I see I have a chat question. Danny has no questions. Thank you, Danny. Okay. So uh, that being the case, why don't we uh, take a look at a couple of things here to finish out your year and make sure you have the proper information for your examination. Let's bring those up right now. Again, just briefly, and many of you have already begun this, I know, because I see postings. Uh, here's the final examination. It's a series of parts, each worth 25 points, where you answer short answer questions about key definitions of our course. You answer a question about the capital analysis, true or false, basically of what assignment four was all about. 
you answer a short, some short answer or multiple choice questions on short-term and long-term financial planning, which is the subject of our, of our discussion this evening. And the final section is of your portfolio as of October 13th, where I'm asking you to find the dividends that were paid by your company or any of your companies in the eight week period of our course. And not during after that or before that, but just during the eight week period of our course, which began on August 25th. So were any dividends paid by your company? And then the usual, what are the gains or losses in dollars and a percent? And then an indication of how the three market indexes have changed in a percent throughout the eight weeks of our class. That's the information that should be in a spreadsheet. You have the template already. I went over this in a, a video or so ago. I, you have that information in Blackboard in the assignment three file folder, I believe. So it's all there. All you have to do is update your work through Friday. And that's our final examination. I want to talk a couple of things about a topic of last week uh, in regards to a debt policy. And uh, particularly, some of it involves what you already know about, the capital structure of a company, that mix of debt and equity that make up the assets of the company. You're very familiar with that when you had to do the weighted average cost of capital calculation in assignment number four. But also that's, that information helps us determine the value of a company in the marketplace. The value of their assets, the total amount of their debt, the total amount of their equity, that tells us what the company is valued in the market. When a company decides to sell or dissolve the business, the value of the firm is what they can get in the market for their assets less the debt that they owe on those assets. What's left over is the equity or the value of the firm. So if somebody says, I sold my company for $10 billion, that's the value of the equity of that company. It's the assets minus the debt equals the value of the company. And that's an important number, especially for some companies who are thinking about cashing out. Many entrepreneurs or small businessmen and women start a company purely for selling of the business. It's kind of like buying a house, but many, many of us sometimes do. We buy a home. We see the market of, our, of where we live bringing up that house value to very big dollars amount, and we decide to sell. Even though we really don't want to move, the value of that asset is so high, we want to cash out and take that money and do something else with it. Buy another house, buy a smaller house, buy a couple of houses. That's the value of the asset. It's what's left over after the mortgage has been paid off, the debt, that's your value. So in other, in other words, capital structure tells us of the relationships of assets and equity and debt, but also tells us market value and the value of the company. That's also very important to know that of a company. And also debt policy. And I think some of you can relate to this. You know, in your own personal financial management, when debt becomes a problem, when your credit card debt becomes a little bit too high, that it takes, takes you more than three months to pay it off. After three months of credit card debt, it can get very expensive. Not only expensive with the interest you have to pay on the outstanding balance, but more importantly, it begins to erode your FICO score. Your FICO score begins to drop because you're letting that debt stay on the books too long. It's the same thing with company. Companies have debt, but if the longer that debt stays at its current levels or even gets higher, it starts eroding earnings. 
it starts eroding the value of a company. It starts taking away from your operating profits because you got to keep paying off that debt with interest. And the company begins to lose value. So to operate personal money management, you try to manage your credit card debt to make it a reasonable amount that you can pay it off in one or two months. Then you have good credit rating and you can manage that a lot more effectively because of the cash flow you're generating from your take-home pay. In companies, it's the exact same way. If companies start getting too much debt, too much leverage, then that erodes the operating value of the company and becomes a problem. And that's one of the reasons why many companies end up selling off part of their businesses. Many companies ending up getting rid of poor performing divisions or products because they need that cash from those poor performing industries. So they sell them off, sell off the assets and take whatever they can for those assets to pay off existing debt and make the company a little bit more easier to manage. At the University of Laverne, we have a program. I don't know if you guys get the information on this, you should. It's called financial coaching, where a student, a faculty member, an alumnus, a staff member can go to certain business faculty and ask them questions about personal money management, how to manage credit, what's a FICO score, how to manage a FICO score, how to obtain and manage assets. We offer these services for free to our community. And a lot of students and staff and faculty take advantage of it because it's free advice. It's free information about any particular situations you might have in your personal finances. Well, in companies, it's somewhat the same, but they have to pay for it. They pay for it with their public accounting firm. They pay for it with consultants. They pay for it by hiring people to manage this and hopefully manage well. One of the most expensive things in a business is to manage a business that's inefficient, not doing well and not managing their assets and their capital promptly. And this is an important characteristic of managing your debt. Very important. Another item we talked about last week was uh, dividends, paying out. And this is one of the key parts of your final question in your portfolio work is what dividends per share did your company that you own stock in your portfolio, when did they, during the course of the eight weeks of our portfolio work, did they pay dividends during that time period? And we went to, I remember a week or so ago in a Zoom, uh, we went to uh, the internet and to Yahoo Finance and looked up under historical prices where you can find that dividend distribution date and how much the dividend was. One of the key reasons you buy stock or one of the key reasons that corporations go out and raise money from the issuance of stock is the liquidity of that stock. In other words, does it generate or is it being planned to generate dividends, cash dividends, dividends during a particular period of time called the X date and the rec record date, stock dividend, stock splits, stocks repurchase, different vehicles to distribute liquidity on equity investments of shareholders. You don't always have to pay them cash, like a dividend check. You can give them stock, issue additional stock to your shareholders as a dividend. You can split the stock. I did this a couple of years ago. Well, now it's many years ago. I owned Apple stock. It was at $50 a share. Apple split, split the stock five to one. In other words, at the end of the stock split, instead of having one share at $50 of, of Apple, I had five shares at $10 of Apple. They split the stock. The value of the stock stayed the same. 
$10 a share. But now I owned more stock because it split the, split the price down to $10. And if I had $50 of stock, that's five additional shares. That's a stock split. Many companies do that to keep loyalty of their shareholders when they don't have the cash to distribute dividends, they issue additional shares of stock to the stockholders. Another thing that's quite prevalent, especially in 2023, is stock repurchase. I might have told this story in a prior class, but I'll tell it again. About two months ago, over the summer, I got a letter from Ford Motor Company. Happened to own about 100 shares of Ford stock. I bought that shares of stock at $9 a share a few years back. Ford is trying to uh, clean up their equity position. In other words, trying to get rid of some shareholders. The reason they're trying to do that, it, lim it eliminates paying a lot of dividends. They buy back the stock. It's called a stock repurchase. So I got a letter from Ford Motor Company saying, Mr. Hasse, we'd like to buy your 100 shares of stock and offer you $15 a share. So that's, you do the math, that's uh, what, $1,500? They offered me a check if I agreed that they would send me a check for $1,500 and they would buy back my 100 shares of stock that I own. Why does Ford do that? As I just said, they want to eliminate shareholders. They want to tighten up the company as to how many shares of stock are outstanding. Why would it be interesting to me? Well, if I bought the stock at nine bucks a couple of years ago and the stock's been fairly flat recently, I have an opportunity to cash out at $15 a share. Now I'm gonna to have to pay capital gains on that, but that's a nice liquidity where I can cash out of the stock. It's called a stock repurchase. I declined the offer because I'm kind of bullish on automobile stocks, especially once they get this strike covered, I think automobile stocks are going to take off in a year or two as the development of electric cars and the cleaning up of fuel efficiencies really kicks into gear, especially after they get this labor situation under control. So I'm going to hang on to the stock. But it's a good way of cashing out by companies offering to buy your stock back from you. Now, what do companies do when they buy back the stock? They hang on to it. It's almost like investing in themselves. And if the stock price goes up over the next few years, they'll go back and reissue that stock in the market and make a nice little profit on their investment in themselves. Apple Computer has done a lot of this lately. So has Amazon. So stock repurchase is another key and area of dividend payments. Who makes the decision to issue a dividend? Well, it's naturally, it's the executive management team of a company, the CEO, the CFO, plus in consultation with the board of directors of the company, they decide how to issue dividends and how much. And basically, dividend decision-making is a PR game. Do the shareholders demand dividends? We better pay it. Do the, do the shareholders care less about dividends? Eh, we don't have to pay it. Let's just hang on to our money. A lot of it is what the investors expect. If they expect dividends, we better pay them. If they expre express different op opinions, we try to keep the investors happy by having targeted payout ratios. If our earnings per share is a dollar and we have a dividend payout rate of 50%, that means the dividend is going to be 50 cents a share. So in other words, it sends a message to the investors that they, whatever the profit is, the company is going to pay 50% of that profit per share as dividends to the shareholder. That's a very popular public relations tool of companies. We make a profit, you get half the profits. You make a, we make a profit, we'll give you 25% of the profits. However that decision is made depends on the need for cash and the need for reinvestment capital within the company, but also the need to keep shareholders happy. 
one of the first things I ask a stockbroker when a stockbroker comes to me and asks, hey, I got a good stock that you should buy. I think it's going to be a nice return for you. The first thing I asked the share the stockholder is number one, what is its current rate of return on that stock in the current year? And number two, what is the targeted payout ratio of the company to pay out dividends of the profits? If the stockbroker doesn't have that information for me, I tend to go jump in the lake. But if he know, if he knows what he's doing, he's going to have that information for me to see whether I feel that's attractive enough to buy the stock. If their payout ratio is 5%, the hell with them. But if their payout ratio is 40, 50, 60%, then every dollar they make in profit, I get that certain percentage in dividends. And in some cases with companies making big profits these days, that can be a very attractive dividend as a form of investment. So the dividend decision process is, uh, is pretty important. Also, as I said earlier, dividends are a PR gimmick to bump up the stock price in the market. If you pay out a nice dividend, the market's going to say, geez, I want to buy this stock. They pay good dividends out. And that usually is a temporary, it's a bump in the price of the stock in the market. They do that to manipulate the stock price. Now, do they guarantee that dividends going to be paid out in the future? No, but they do say that we're thinking about making a big dividend payout. That usually gives the price of the stock a bump in demand in the market. So it's a public relations gimmick for companies. So debt management, capital structure management, dividend management are all creative means by which a company's financial team can manage the business. And another key area, key area of that is long-term financial planning. Just like you and I, we live paycheck to paycheck, month to month financially. A lot of us do. I do. But when you have that point in your career, when you start making a little bit more money or having a little bit more assets to manage, your short-term planning becomes long-term planning. How am I saving for retirement? How am I saving for a new car in three or four years? How am I planning for a new home or a larger home for my growing family? Or how am I planning maybe to leave the area and move to another part of the country? And do I have enough capital or cash to do that? That's just, this is part of our everyday lives in our own family management. But for companies, it's especially important in financial planning because that's what investors look at to make sure that you have a solid financial planning model. And then they'll invest with you. Banks will lend you money. Individuals or, or pension funds or insurance companies will buy up your stock. If they feel your long-term plans correlate with what they want to do with their investments, do they, do you match up with investors as far as providing long-term financial planning? Once you get a job in financial management with a company, the first, first year or so you're doing financial statement analysis. You're doing analysis of the company's fiscal ratios, financial ratios, a lot like we, what you've been doing in this class. But once you establish yourself in a company, your next phase of the business operations in financial management is be part of the financial planning team, analyzing choices that you can do in the future for the business. What markets or what assets can we acquire? What other areas can we take the business to to develop new revenue sources? Colleges and universities are struggling with this today as we speak. Many colleges and finance and college and colleges and community colleges are going are running into financial problems. Their revenue model is not growing. High school graduates are dropping because of the population growth. Many people are postponing going to college because it's too expensive until they can find somebody to help them pay for it. So financial models are constantly changing in 
university management. And what many universities are trying to do now is to find alternative sources of revenue, renting out buildings to businesses to use, finding alternative ways of generating revenue. And this is part of any company, is always analyzing what the future is. Now, what is the future? Most businesses try to financial plan three to five years out. After five years, it's a crapshoot and you really don't know what you're doing. Too many mysteries, too many unknowns five years out. But many companies try to find alternative ways of where the, they see the company going three to five years out. And within the, your own businesses that many of you work, there's a team of people or one individual, that's their job, is to see where the company's going to be in three to five years. And that's fin financial planning. You have a time horizon, as I just said, three to five years. Also, you have different outcomes, optimistic or best case scenario, expected, most likely scenario, or pessimistic or worst case scenario. Three different way outlooks on how your company is going to be in the future. And really for a sound financial map planning of your own personal finances, you should have different alternatives. What happens if somebody in your family gets sick? What do you have available to maintain your living standards? What happens if you lose your job? Or what happens if you wanna take some time off and say, screw you to your job and get some good time, a well-being time at home? Can you do that? What happens if all of a sudden you get a pay raise? What are your plans to do with that increased income? Financial planning going out more than one or two years is imperative to manage your business to the most efficient level. It's to solve, to present contingency planning. Do I need new infrastructure down the road? It gives you options to consider of where your business is going. And it also forces you to do your job. It forces consistency in the company. You're all on the same wavelength of developing new businesses, new growth. A planning model is pretty simple. The inputs are your current financial statements. Where you stand now. What do you, where do you, where is your business today? The planning side of it is where do you think those financial statements are going to look like in two, three, four, or five years? What is the her historical growth rate of your financials? And can you maintain or even exceed those growth rates into the future? And the outputs are called pro forma financial statements. What do you think your company is going to look like? What's the forecasted financials in the future? At the University of Laverne, we project out three years in financial planning. Now, historically speaking, that third year never, never happens. We're always off. It's because of the nature of our business. It's difficult to plan that we're going to, how many students we're going to have in three years with the economy, with the cost structure, with financial aid, it's difficult. But you try to find the best model that can help you plan the future. And it all starts with you understanding financial statements of your company currently. What is your current growth rate over the last few years? Is your debt position getting any weaker or stronger? All these play into where you think your company is going next year. Here's a typical financial planning model. Now in your final examination, we ask some questions concerning financial modeling. Remember net income is equal to retained earnings that you keep plus dividends. So you, the amount of money you, you have in net income, it's split two ways. It can go to retained earnings, you can hang on to those profits inside your, inside your business, or you can distribute it in dividends 
to your shareholders. But if we bring in new assets to the business, how will our profits change? We'll be, we'll be generating more profits by bringing in new assets. But at the same time, how are we going to finance those new assets? Are we going to use our profits or are we going to use external financing? Going out and borrowing more money, issuing new stock. The key in financial planning is have limited external financing and self-finance your growth. Now, as individual and personal money managers of ourselves, that's next to impossible. If we want to buy a new asset like a house, we're going to need external financing, a mortgage. Not too many of us have a half a million dollars sitting in our bank accounts that we can go out and write a check for a new house in Southern California. So external financing is a must for people like us who have very little equity. But corporations have a lot of equity, a lot of capital. So they cannot go out and acquire new assets by using the profits that they're already making off their existing assets. Many times they don't have to go out and borrow more money. Many times they don't have to go out and issue new stock, which is external finance. The key to financial planning for corporations is to minimize your external financing, which is expensive money, interest rates, return to investors, and maximize your profits that you make and reinvest in the company. Some businesses don't make much money, so that's, that's a challenge. But many companies like Apple, Amazon, big companies with big profits, they can self-finance growth. They don't need extra capital from outside sources. And that's a big plus. But these are what financial management models are all about. A way to determine what we think our company is going to look at, look like in the future. What is our growth rate going to be into the future? And is there a gap between that growth rate and do we need extra capital to finance our growth? And that's called external funds. When do we reach the point that if growth rate becomes so fast that we can't self-finance with our profits, we have to go out and borrow money or issue new stock? It's the same thing in our own personal finances. And that's why I keep going back to this. If we want to go to the movies or go out to a fancy, have a fancy dinner, we can pretty well finance that from our take-home pay. We just will cut out other expenses and be able to do that. Or use short-term credit like a credit card and pay it off in 30 days. That's easy to manage. But if we want to go out and purchase a major capital asset like an automobile, a new washer dryer, or a new car, I mean a new home, then our growth rate or our capital that we produce through pay ain't going to be enough and we have to go out and acquire extra funds, external funds, the borrowing of a car loan, using credit long term. And it's the exact same thing in a company. But companies that are already heavily in debt can't go out and get those external funds by the borrowing of money because they just cannot afford that additional debt on their credit rating. And that's a key part of financial planning. When does external growth begin to be too costly? And that's when you see companies start selling off divisions, selling off areas of their business to obtain the cash so they can concentrate on growth in specific areas of the business that they're doing well. That's long-term financial planning. And finally, probably more important to a lot of us and to small business men and women is short-term financial planning. The management of working capital, the management of short-term funds. Remember working capital is the short-term investments, the inventory, the receivable management of a company. That's short-term financial management. Investors look at two things in a company if they're going to invest in. Do they have the potential for future growth as far as revenue generation and increase market share of their business? And number two, do they manage their working capital 
efficiently? Do they collect their receivables on time? Do they have just marginal inventory levels just to maintain their stock? Any additional liquidity they have, do they invest out longer term and get higher interest? That's a key ingredient in looking at the efficiencies of a management of an organization. Yes, they manage their company and they're making good growth. But at the same time, are they taking advantage of that money that you're generating growth with and getting maximized dollars out of that growth? Are they investing it long term? Are they keeping minimal levels of working capital? Are they maintaining the liquidity of the company? It's called cash management. Making sure you have just enough cash in the bank to meet payroll and pay your bills on a monthly basis. Any additional cash that you have that you don't need, invest it out. Put it out there longer term at a higher rate. One of the key facets of my recommendations for individuals in personal financial management is they should have three months of paychecks in the bank in a savings account or some type of money market account. Three months of paychecks. That, in case, that gives them liquidity. That means if something happens, they have an unnecessary, ex, an, an additional expense, somebody gets sick, you lose your job, you got three months of paychecks in the bank, liquid that you can use. Not earning much interest because it's in a savings or money market account, but it's maintaining liquidity. Once you have that three months in there, now you can begin to invest any additional capital Longer term, buy into a high yield fund, earning 6% interest, invest in the market, whatever, invest in yourself, go to graduate school, buy a new car, whatever. But you don't have to maintain liquidity to do that. Companies are exactly the same way. You always want to look at the company's short-term cash position. Do they have enough cash to pay their bills every month? Payroll, accounts payable. If they're constantly borrowing money to meet day-to-day -day expenses, I'd stay the hell away from that company because they're not maintaining efficiencies. It's costing them money to operate their business. And that's working capital. That's short-term financial management. Remember, cash management is three key areas, collecting the receivables, paying the bills, both payroll and accounts payable, and then investing or selling long-term assets that are more than one year old. If you manage your cash by having enough cash to pay your bills on a month-to-month -month basis and, and sending out any additional capital long-term, the company is being managed efficiently. Problem is, a lot of companies, this is a problem. I don't know if any of you have ever worked for a company, but uh, I have some friends, fortunately this has never happened to me, but I have some friends today who work for companies and every paycheck, when they open their envelope, there's a little slip. There's no check, there's a slip saying, could you not cash this until next Monday? <laughs> Could you not, could you hold off on cashing your paycheck? Naturally, they're going to do that because they don't want the bounce. When you bounce a check, your bank thinks you're an idiot, not the people who issued the check. That, hurt, that hurts your credit. So you wait. But if you keep getting that for a, on a regular basis from a company, either you got to think about maybe changing jobs or maybe this company needs some better cash management procedures because this is ridiculous. You're losing employees. They're going to leave because you're not paying them on a regular basis and you don't have to on a, on a weekly basis or biweekly basis because they got to wait to cash their paychecks. This is, a, this is a problem with a lot of small businesses, even today. And companies are reluctant to dip into their line of credit because today line of credit is 13, 13 and a half percent. Prime interest rate plus 3%. And you guys should know that from your WAC calculation in assignment four. Oh.
prime interest rate. <gasps> wow. It's expensive to borrow money, especially for small business women and businessmen. It's prime plus three, four, five percent. That gets to be a little expensive when the prime interest rates are high. So managing your short-term capital is key to establishing efficiencies within your business. So those are four key areas that are talked about in some of our questions on the final examination. Capital structure, dividends, long-term planning, and short-term working capital or cash management planning. The final pieces of financial management for any successful or unsuccessful business is to be able to manage how you distribute, it, distribute your return to shareholders and how you manage your long-term and short-term capital assets of your business. If you're doing that all successfully, your business is going to be competitive and efficient to all your competitors. And that's what investors look for. That's what banks look for. And to be perfectly honest, that's what employees expect in their managers of their institution, that they're running the company the most efficient way possible, short-term and long-term. And that's where we come to the end of our financial management study, is now with this information, some of you can go on to master's in business administration study where you look at the particular strategies of how to become efficient managers. Look at specific strategies of how to manage and modeling of long-term and short-term capital. That's what graduate school is about, the strategies of these efficiencies. And you study that because you'll be a manager, a leader, a supervisor, and you need to incorporate these things in the managing of your departments. That's what graduate study is all about. But we stop here in undergraduate study because now you have the definitions of what working capital, short-term management, long-term management, dividend management, capital structure management. Those are the definitions we've talked about in these final couple of weeks. And we put all of this in motion really in assignment number four. All of those are used in determining the cash flow and determining the investment return of that particular asset that you looked at in assignment four. So that's how this all kind of comes together in the last couple weeks of the class. Another couple of interesting things that are in our week eight file folder about financial planning is this financial fact for week eight, the Glass-Siegel Act. This Glass-Siegel Act happened in the, uh, I believe in the 1990s, 80s, where it changed the banking industry. It allowed Wells Fargo to become an investment bank. It allowed Bank of America to go from a commercial bank to an investment bank and be able to generate return or earnings, not only on the managing of people's deposits and the lending out of mortgages and credit cards, but also investing in companies for return. The whole financial industry changed with this act of the 1980s, and then it was kicked out by Congress in 1999, and that was one of the main reasons why we had the global crisis of 2008, is because banks didn't know how to operate and understand vehicles of the crisis of credit management. That's an interesting little tidbit. Some of this information is what we just talked about, understanding a financial plan, what are financial models? What is cash management, working capital management? So these are all key parts and these questions are asked and looked at in the final. So if you get stumped or have a problem with 
some of those questions, especially in regards to financial planning. Refer to this lecture, refer to this information, refer to the PowerPoint and or the textbook and you can find some of those answers. So as we wrap up the course, a couple things to mention. Number one, it's been a pleasure to have you in class in this circumstances of remote learning and seeing your faces every work every week. Yeah. I've enjoyed it. You guys are good students. I've already seen this. The assignment number four was not an easy assignment because it asked you to do financial calculations, which I think all of you did very well, but also interpret those financial analysis interpretations into a writing assignment. That's not easy. And I think you all did very well on that. And secondly, is to use this course as a vehicle going forward, not only in your in, in financial management of corporations and understanding what that's all about, but also in your own personal financial management, how you can use some of these traits to help you decide on how you manage your family's money efficiently. And then finally, you now have me as a member of your network somebody that you can refer to for questions, for recommendations, for references, and for information. And I hope you can include me in the future if you need anything along those lines. So as I uh, wrap up this video, does anybody have, have any last minute questions or concerns? Okay, well, Monica, Gabriella, Matt, Amanda, thank you. You guys are the core of this class over the last eight weeks, and I can always count on you to be around in the evening. So I appreciate your commitment, and I appreciate you participating uh, by uh, being online and taking in our class. So I want to thank you very much for doing that. Don't forget, and I'll remind you again about the course evaluation. They're a real good tool. Uh, for us at Laverne to gauge our students and provide a better product. They are, trust me. I know that for a fact. So if you can complete those evaluations, I would appreciate it. I'm going to be around the rest of the week. If any of you have any questions or something looks funny on the exam and you need some interpretations. And if you have a concern about your grade as I post assignment four grades and you look at your cumulative grade in this course, if you have questions about that, please make sure you ask me those questions and make sure you get answers that you need to in order to understand where you are standing in this class. Well, everybody, that's it. It's time to watch the Dodgers lose again. And it's time to uh, end our class and start finishing up our final examination work. So again, I wanna thank all of you for participating and for being such good students in a somewhat challenging situation of remote learning, but I think you all mastered it very well. So I commend you. And I hope to see you all down the line in future courses or future work, or just uh, maybe seeing you physically live at graduation when it comes time for you all to graduate. Make sure you look me up. I'll be the goofy looking guy on stage in, a, in one of those zoot suit graduation gears. Make sure you, you grab me and say hi when you graduate. I would love to see you. Okay, everybody. For one last time, this is Professor Hassey saying adios. Have a great week. Thank you so much, Professor. Have a good day. Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Hang in there and be well.